Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're here to help you stay curious. We're in our Apollo gallery. Boy, is it a mess, Marty. Marty Winkle, my co-producer and the lead electrical engineer 53 years ago when Apollo 11 just launched off the moon 53 years ago, just a couple hours ago. We watched it here at the museum on uh, Apollo real time. And at 5.40 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time is when they dock with they being Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin when they dock with Mike Collins and mission accomplished. All they got to do is get back to the uh, home, to, to planet Earth. But that's the moment when the Grumman employees that built the lunar module, when they dock with the command module America, I mean Columbia, that's when Marty Winkle, a Grumman guy, and, and his team could celebrate because the job wasn't done until with that lunar module until they got it to the mothership. And what a fabulous story, 53 years ago. Here's the headlines around the world. All right, man on the moon. The pictures that you see in these old newspapers were taken by photographers off the television screen as the astronauts walked for two hours live on a video camera that was placed out there. We didn't have pictures of the landing or anything them on the moon, of course, until they came back from Earth three days from now. Imagine the photo lab that was developing those uh, precious pictures there at the Houston uh, Johnson Space Center. So uh, to look back 53 years, a half a century, are you kidding me? And we've not been back to the moon. And we, we've been talking about it all week. And, and uh, you're going to see a little program that I put together for an astronomy club last night to give you some unusual uh, how 50 years later some of these photos are still being enhanced and will shock you with one uh, here in just a few minutes. So stay curious. So we're going to talk about uh, the Apollo 11 53 years ago. The boot on the moon. All right, that we've got a replica of here at our American Space Museum. All right, of the the overshoe that uh, that Neil and Buzz put on. They should have brought one or two of those back with them, but they didn't. Uh, so, and I can't. Um, I don't know why a, a J July twentieth is not a national holiday. Okay, it really should be. In fact, President Nixon, when he talked to the astronauts on the moon at about 11:15 uh, oh, last night, Eastern Daylight Time, I was watching it. He pointed out that the entire world was watching them. And what event can you think of that the entire world was focused on? They really were, too, Marty, right? Uh, you saw Marty was so immersed in, in building, helping build the lunar module that they didn't know much about what was going on in the outside world. But um, uh, it was true. The whole world of about 4 billion people around TV is watching this. So we're going to share some, a little bit about that history with it there. But uh, we thank uh, Andrew uh, Oliva and Tom Celentano and uh, Robert Law for chiming in today uh, when we uh, posted on Facebook a picture of this gentleman there with our office manager, Anita Truex. That is astronaut Charlie Walker. He was a mission specialist on 41D, 51D, and 61B in 84 and 85, one of the early astronauts and the first non-military uh, person to go to space as he was working with uh, McDonnell Douglas on a payload there. That's the first non-military person. Non He's the first non-military person to go to space, Marty. Well, he's got an asterisk by him because he was involved. He was in the military briefly, and then to get in the X-15, I think he's briefly in the Air Force. But uh, Armstrong was a civilian that walked on the moon at the time he walked on the moon. But uh, we're splitting hairs here uh, that, that, that uh, this guy was the first person to go for a private company to go to space, Northrop Grumman, all right, and a great guy. And, uh, Awesome guy, huh? McDonald Douglas. McDonald Douglas, yes, McDonald Douglas. He thought he was going to go one time with the experiment that they were working on, and he ended up going two more times, 20 days in space. He wanted to uh, come here and see our godfather, Charlie Mars, that we had on here uh, last uh, Tuesday. 
with another Charlie, Charlie Murphy. So Charlies are everywhere right now, Marty. But uh, what a great guy. Uh, he just wanted to see the museum. He stuck around for over an hour in the mishmash as you're looking at here. Uh, the fl tiles, the floor carpet has been taken up and ready for new carpet tiles to be put down uh, next week. So we're about a $50,000 project going on here at the American Space Museum. Those of you that have been here, you'll see a lot of improvements when you come back. Thank you for Charlie Walker. I just wanted to mention I went out and he is on the Space Coast. He's the astronaut of the day at Kennedy Visitors Complex. I went out there to saw him today like I told him I would. And uh, he teased me and said, Mark, did you watch the astronauts walk, walk on the moon? Did they, everything turn out okay last night? And I go, yeah, it did 53 years later. And I go, Charlie, how many times did you take the shuttle to the moon? And he laughed because there are people out there that think the shuttle went to the moon, but it did not. It never went further than about 450 miles above the Earth's surface. That was where the Hubble telescope mission. So, but a great guy. And uh, those of you that met him know uh, what a wonderful, affable person he is. He'll be back. Charlie Walker said he'll be back on the Space Coast in October, Marty, and promises to be on a Stay Curious segment. Uh, which he has watched a few of them before. So if you want to help our funding for our our campaign here for the uh, uh, flooring that is a major deal, you can buy one of these T-shirts and help defray the admittance fees that we're not getting for the next uh, three weeks. We, we, we will reopen um, August 8th. But uh, Paul Cowley, in, uh, who's passed away, was one of the first of eight artists brought to the Kennedy Space Center by James Webb in 1963 and four for uh, 1963 actually for Gordon Cooper's uh, Mercury flight that is his sketch of Armstrong in the middle be great on a woman's t-shirt that we have those styles available for twenty two dollars and for twenty five dollars you can get either color one the Chris Kelly uh, his uh, Ed, Ed White in Spacewalk, that's a painting, not a photograph. And then his dad's famous Power to Go, the uh, rocket, uh, uh, at Saturn V rocket engines igniting. So it says on the back the name that we have on the front there uh, behind the collar. So you're going to love these T-shirts. Uh, we're getting orders put together, pre-ordered, and we hope to have some printed up uh, by as early as next week and start shipping them out because you have responded. So. Get your t-shirt order right here, gang. Whip your phone out. Get that QR code, and it'll all do the rest. And uh, women, get a size up. If you're a medium, buy a large in the ladies' tees, we're told. So, well, let's have a little program here. Oh, one more plug for Chris Callie, who uh, really wants to support our museum with his artwork. This is one of his latest artwork pieces, incorporating the photograph of the Artemis 1 SLS rocket taken by Mark Usiak. Hi, Mark. I know you're watching. And Tom, big brother Tom's out there in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, is where those, those uh, great supporters of the American Space Museum are. Uh, Chris is selling this uh, in prints, by the way. And you can go to uh, CaliSpaceArt.com, and they'll take care of the rest. Well, let's go to the moon again in 1969. As I've told you many times, I was a teenager. Uh, what an impactful uh, thing on my life. Uh, uh, that and the assassination of President Kennedy, I can just about relive every hour uh, of, of those events going on as they went on in my mind. As a 15-year-old boy, I was 10 when Kennedy got assassinated. Quite a time. The Civil Rights Movement was uh, hot and heavy. The Vietnam War was uh, escalating. Uh, I was just a few years away from the draft and kind of thinking about that. Marty Winkle, my co-producer, was in Vietnam before he did a tour of duty there with the, the Marines. And then uh, uh, he uh, came back to the States and got a job working for Grumman on the lunar module. And uh, he is one of our national treasures, uh, uh, we call them, because of working on uh, our American space program. So wasn't just the Apollo program, it was the entire NASA program that went to the moon because we needed the stepping stones of Mercury and Gemini to prove 
and, and test and demonstrate all of the techniques that were involved. Of course, the moon was first conquered and thought about in a way by Galileo in 1609 is when Galileo you have, uh, took uh, his small telescope and looked at the moon and made these sketches. If you have binoculars, 8 by 35 or 8 by 50 binoculars, 8 magnification, that's more magnification than Galileo had. He had about a 6 magnification telescope. And it's very complicated going to the moon. Over 150 things had to go right. And if one of those 150 things didn't go right, things were compromised. But the final 20 things going to the moon, we checked off about 10 of those on Apollo 10 doing everything but landing in April 1969 and then the July, uh, no it was May 69 I believe was the uh, Apollo 10 and then July was the, the, the attempt and even, uh, it was an attempt, it was an engineering feat and those last 10 things that had to go right or, or boy they, uh, uh, the astronauts were either going to be in big time trouble or they would have to push the button and separate the ascent stage before landing and get back to the mother ship. But we did it. We walked on the moon, man on the moon. And the headlines around the world. And, you know, a New York Times and L.A. Times might be worth $20, $30, but newspapers don't hold a lot of value. But here, Marty, I'm going to show this uh, uh, Houston. Uh, this is a good one to have. The Houston Chronicle, which was an evening paper, saying uh, Armstrong Aldrin leave the moon on July 3rd, 21st, 1969. And uh, as I read a few little things that they say about it here, is uh, uh, the lunar trailblazers of Apollo 11 today were only one step away from home and safety as they launched themselves into orbit from the surface of the moon. And they rendezvoused with Mike Collins. They were 21 and a half hours parked on the moon. Uh, and uh, uh, in history, of the human race, Armstrong achieved his niche of immortality, it says here. And because the, of, because the world and that he and Aldrin conquered the barren void, wind and rain, the evidence of their first visit will be preserved perhaps 50,000 years if scientists are right. Uh, uh, certainly where they, they're, they're already thinking, certainly the place where the crude spaceship Eagle landed is destined to become a shrine for future generations, all right? And uh, so what a, but the other headline below that, Marty, Luna 15 lands 500 miles from Apollo 11. Well, the Russians, not to be outdone, sent an unmanned spacecraft to the moon because they were beat by the manned space flight. They basically threw the towel in on Apollo 8 orbiting the moon in December 1968, Christmas Eve. But this Luna 15 was going to bring back a scoop of, of, of lunar soil and possibly beat the lunar soil coming back to the Earth, all right? And though it landed, things went wrong, and they never did get to bring the uh, soil back to the, uh, the Earth. Uh, even Mike Collins asked about it uh, on the way back from the moon. Is, is, where's that Luna 15? Is it going to beat us? Uh, could beat the U.S. mission back by bringing the first samples uh, uh, that it had landed, but uh, I believe that uh, uh, th then then the signals ended, and the famous Jodrell Observatory by Sir Bernard Lovell said that uh, Luna 15 was dead silent. So, and uh, I know uh, uh, Robert Law is watching in Scotland. He's probably been to Jodrell Bank Observatory. That was a famous. Uh, uh, radio dish that would intercept actually the Russian transmissions uh, and they didn't like that and Bernard Lovell was the chief astronomer there very famous guy at the time well as we look at our heroes okay a little bit of background there Mike Collins uh, to the far left there was actually born in uh, Rome Italy uh, by a traveling uh, 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 um, military father uh, and he died April 28th, 2021. He's been gone over a year at age 90. For those of you who didn't know, Mike Collins, uh, he enjoyed his anonymity. He didn't bother him a bit that he was orbiting the earth while Neil and Buzz were getting all the fame. He later uh, 
the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. opened up in 1972. He became its director, and he liked to draw watercolors and, and uh, uh, oil colors, mostly of Florida landscape and fauna, birds and things like that. Very rarely did his uh, artwork encompass anything space-related. Uh, so that was Michael Collins. Uh, both these men, all three, were about were 40 years old during the journey. All right, think about that. They were in the prime of their lives. Some of us say life begins at 40. Buzz Aldrin there in the middle is 92 years old, and and he ha I didn't look at his Twitter feed yesterday, uh, but he's a Twitter guy, and I'll bet he had some cool things to say about his his mates and being on the moon. He's 92 years old. Uh, Buzz was born in um, uh, Glen Ridge, New York, all right, uh, New Jersey, I'm, I'm sorry, Glen Ridge, New Jersey, and uh, if you didn't know, he legally changed his name from Edwin Aldrin to Buzz Aldrin, all right, uh, and uh, that was kind of coincided with the Pixar movie Buzz Light Lightyear, I, I, I think, but he is officially the buzzer, Buzz uh, uh, on uh, everything legal. And uh, his, his sister couldn't pronounce uh, Edward. He came out almost like Buzz. And that's why they started calling him Buzz. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, th thank you, Marty. Yeah, his sister was calling him Buzz. It had nothing to do with Buzz Lightly here. It was about that time that he changed his name, though. But yeah, his, he got the nickname because his sister called him Buzz because she couldn't pronounce Edward. And uh, uh, thank you, Marty. That's a, a good space piece of trivia. Uh, that I didn't want to mess up. Uh, he's a character, uh, uh, and, and then, uh, there, of course, Neil Armstrong there. Let's look at them a little bit older there. Um, near, there they are at the 40th anniversary, which was a, a, the biggest gathering they actually had of all the anniversaries was the 40th. Um, uh, all, uh, Neil Armstrong died at age 82 uh, by a botched medical procedure at the University of Cincinnati. They had paid dearly for that. He had a uh, bypass surgery uh, that uh, developed some complications, and uh, and he died in the hospital because of that. And uh, you can find uh, that uh, that I said it was a malpractice situation that has been written about, and I'm not telling tales about that. Sad but true. Uh, but, you know, Marty and I were talking about, well, where's Armstrong buried? I, he grew up in Wapakoneta, Ohio, where I uh, grew up in Findlay, Ohio, about 90 miles north on I-75. I've been to his, his museum in Wapakoneta, fabulous museum. It's got the biggest moon rock, Marty, I've ever seen in captivity, so to speak, outside at the Lunar Receiving Lab uh, mock-up there at Johnson Space Center, where they got boulders in there. Uh, but the rock there is about the size of a pear. Pretty good. Yeah, maybe not that big. I exaggerate. Let's, let's whittle it down to a, 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 a peach pit, maybe. But it's a pretty big moon rock there in Wapakoneta. Um, so where's he buried? You'd think people would beat a path to his grave, right? Uh, a man that has reached immortality. Well, I think the very humble Neil Armstrong did not want that because his ashes... He was cremated and his ashes were scattered in the Atlantic Ocean on the USS Philippine Sea. That uh, was the name of the ship that took his, so he is scattered in the Atlantic Ocean. Isn't that interesting? Um, all right, let's get into a little bit of the moon landing there. And uh, here in our Apollo gallery that, that uh, uh, is just uh, take that picture away and make me bigger there, Marty. Uh, look at what's going on here. Floors are getting done. We're, we're going to start doing carpet. We've got the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, in, the cargo integrated test stand that should be in the shuttle galleries over here in our Apollo gallery. And uh, things are going to be a little confusing to put together. Sure, Marty, give him a little pan around there. In there, right behind me, the gray are the pieces of the. Uh, uh, the shuttle uh, lab that we, the shuttle launch control that we have there, uh, just everything everywhere, uh, all over here. There's our docent desk buried behind those racks there. And Marty goes the other way. There's the uh, cargo integration stand behind me. There's where all the, uh, the, the shuttle gallery where we have the 
um, our our launch uh, uh, fueling station there is in pieces. That was a big thing to take apart. And uh, I don't know who the crew is, but they've done a good job. We'll get their name and give them some love next week on Stay Curious, maybe tomorrow down there. So uh, thank you, Marty, for giving us a little pan around there. And Marty and I are thinking about going to Space View Park and getting some shows from there recorded. So look forward to that. Well, let's get on the moon. And let's talk about that a little bit. And uh, let me go back there, make me big, make me small. Of course, there's uh, stills from the moon landing walk. It looked very crude, okay, but 50 years ago, that was the best we could do. There was no live uh, video except this two hours. They did do some video going to the moon and back, of course. Uh, and it was, and those, those were color, but this was a black and white video cam set up and uh, uh, when we go back to the moon with Artemis and, uh, and they will have so many cameras everywhere, it's going to look like a, a National Football League trailer with uh, 100 monitors everywhere to switch which one we want to show uh, of the landing and the, the, the first woman and, 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 and a man to walk on the moon. So um, uh, I wanted to mention, yes, Artemis. They've got a date, Marty. I know you saw it, August 29th, about 11.30. What's your sheet there, Marty, say in front of you that we printed out? What's uh, I, We're choosing August 29th, a Monday. 8.30 a.m. 8.30 a.m. So, wow. Two-hour two window. Two-hour window. We're going to be busy as all get out here. Uh, so get your hotel room uh, reserved for that Sunday. Come down Sunday if they have a delay. I think they got a two-day window on that opening there. But it's unmanned, uncrewed Orion spacecraft. Uh, they'll probably uh, get it out there at least a week ahead of time, wouldn't you think, Marty? Yeah. But, it, uh, but uh, the Artemis program's not like the Apollo program. They're doing things a little different. In fact, it's got a lot of the photographers on edge because they don't know where they're going to be able to photograph this. This behemoth of a rocket that yes, it will have the most powerful rocket in the world to be launched. Now it's scheduled for August 29th, but four million pounds of that eight million pounds of thrust comes from those solid rocket boosters on either side. The Saturn V rocket had pure liquid fuel, uh, no solid rocket boosters on it. So it's in a class of itself, that Saturn V. Here's Neil going down the ladder as you saw it on television. Uh, as I saw it on television and hope some of you did uh, but uh, it got enhanced a little bit uh, 50 years this all these pictures and videos and, and film uh, are over 50 years old so people have been enhancing them even on their own to kind of tweak things uh, and, and NASA had all of the, the film that was taken of all of their their missions throughout their history of course redigitized in a more sensitive way. Uh, but uh, here's what I did 53 years ago. This is a sketch that I made of the Neil and Buzz on the moon, inspired to do that while I was watching them. I don't consider myself much of an artist, but hey, Chris Callie, I was using a pen pencil back then uh, because uh, Chris Callie has kind of inspired me to be more of a pencil drawer than a photographer. After all, not too many people are making pencil drawings of the the uh, SpaceX launches, and I've done a few of them. Maybe I'll show you one of those one day. But not to brag on my work uh, as being very good or anything, but it was just my way to record history as I saw it uh, 53 years ago when it was happening. Kind of incredible that I've even hung on to that, Marty, all these years. But when you, that's the digital world. I didn't have, have to find it in a box or a, a drawer somewhere. I just Googled the. Uh, 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 Mark's Apollo 11 uh, drawing and uh, got, it, got it hidden in a bunch of uh, external hard drives. Well, here it is inside the lunar module that Marty Winkle uh, worked. This was his one of his workplaces. Uh, Marty was the lead electrical engineer, my co-producer here. So proud of him doing that. And then he segued into the uh, uh, shuttle world as a, a manager of the launch process system engines, uh, the shuttle engines. Marty was over 40 people uh, in the, the computer end of those engines there. He was an electrical engineer, and Marty, where, where's this photo taken? Somebody's sitting on the acid engine cover. 
He said someone's sitting on the ascent engine cover. Now imagine that you're in a Volkswagen bus and the engine hump is in that bus. I think some of you know what I'm talking about. They grew up in the 60s and 70s. And that's what the, uh, the ascent engine uh, was actually uh, inside of the ascent, uh, the top of it in there. The power head. The power head that he's talking about. Uh, Hypergolic fuels, meaning these fuels that I can't pronounce the names of, hit each other and ignited. No, no ignition needed. What's missing in this photo, you see the triangular windows, and right there in the middle, Marty, why don't you do a little magic with your... Uh, uh, What's missing is someone, uh, they didn't put in the computer, the DSKY computer that fits there. It just looks like a big adding machine with big numbers, one through zero, and, and a, a, a button that says noun and verb on it, because that was the language of the uh, luminary program that the Massachusetts Institute of Technology computer geeks up there put the program together. Uh, luminary and Sunburst was the one for the command module. And uh, they had 64K memory, you computer people out there. 64K memory, they would enter P62 was one of the programs to initiate the uh, ignition of the uh, uh, descent stage. P64 was when they would hit to roll over at one mile and look out those triangular windows that were angled in so the guys could see right out the windows at the, uh, the, the ground. And when they looked out, they were three miles off course because of something called mass concentrations on the moon. Buried under the moon's surface are concentrations of iron and metal that sped up the lunar module as it passed over one, as, gra as gravity's influence will do. And that, that one second additional speeding up took them off their course. So it was even more incredible that Neil Armstrong smoothly landed Eagle, uh, tail number LM5, Grumman people call it, uh, without having practiced in the terrain uh, like they did for six months uh, in the flight crew training building in the what was called the, uh, the best uh, video game in the world at the time. Marty, do you have a comment or a question there? Okay, show them the hand the handles that uh, 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 Neil Armstrong had his hands on. Uh, uh, the the one on the the left of the yellow yellow post is actually a twisting looking lever there. And which one was that? Was that the up or down? Uh, and and the other one was the the yaw on there. So so go to the other handle that looks like a joystick, and he would uh, that was the. Uh, the attitude, attitude control. Roll pitch and yaw. Yeah, roll pitch and yaw. He would fire the RCS jets. And, and RCS jets would be firing there. So a peek inside the lunar module there. But here's some of the moon rocks they brought back. Uh, uh, this wasn't all of them. They brought back 57 pounds of moon rock. They took 97 photographs on the surface of the moon, including those they took out the windows. Marty, I may have seen on Facebook more than 97 pictures of people's food on their vacation. Okay, for God's sakes. But it was film days, Hasselblad cameras that our good friend Tom Usiak used to uh, photograph uh, his many splendid shuttle images. Uh, Hasselblad cameras, to those of you that don't know, is not 35 millimeter film. It's twice the size, 70 millimeter film which would give you better resolution. Neil Armstrong was the photographer, had the camera. Most of the time he handed it off to Buzz for about 15 minutes and Buzz didn't take any pictures of Neil on the moon. Uh, I think Buzz went over and took pictures of his experiments he laid out. And then one picture from the distance we're gonna see of the backside of Neil uh, working at, uh, on, at the lunar module. And uh, so it's kind of sad, but we're gonna see, there are two pictures of Neil on the moon. Now we're going to show you the close-ups of the landing of the descent stage that Marty had his, he didn't have his fingerprints all over because he had to wear gloves all the time, but but he certainly is familiar with walking around what you see the bright spot in the middle, why don't you point that out Marty, is a descent stage. You actually see the path that the men walked because uh, the, the lunar soil that was as finer than talcum powder was lighter at the top and darker beneath. So like snow, you would see the snow traces in there. And what's pointed out there 
is the uh, the the L R R R. That is the lunar reflective uh, reflectors that uh, uh, you can, if you have a powerful enough laser, hit that reflector and it'll bounce the signal back to you. Going to the wrong item. <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's the uh, there's the descent stage. Okay, uh, a little bit shadow because uh, it would be about well, uh, how tall would that be, Marty? Six feet tall? Was it over your head? Yeah, when you. With the landing gear down, it was over your head, so it's probably seven feet to up to the platform. Eight yeah, about eight foot, Marty says, and then and then uh, the other uh, height of the lunar module, uh, the uh, ascent stage, uh, was about. If that was eight, then the ascent stage would be about eighteen feet tall, seventeen feet tall, something like that. So see that big crater to the right, where you see the footprints too. Those are Neil's footprints. That's the furthest he walked away from the lunar module, okay? And if you watch the movie First Man, and I encourage you to do that, it's like a Hallmark movie of uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, moon landing, but it's based on his autobiography, his uh, true biography by him, uh, and uh, talks about the families, the kids, the wives in a way that you've never heard before. And he had a daughter, Muffy, and she had cancer and she had radiation treatment when a little girl this is how the movie opens up is this poor little girl being treated treated with radiation she's six or seven years old back in 1968 think of how wild that was back then an unknown territory and muffy died and supposedly her name was on like those little blocks that they put around a wristband and uh i was told by jay barbary uh, uh, privately, and he's t he's alluded to it in his talks. He was the uh, uh, TV reporter that uh, uh, was at every launch, and he passed away a little over a year ago. Jay Barbary said that Neil took that bracelet and put it in Con in that east crater there, and it's depicted as he did something like that in the movie. So, um, and that was a devastating thing for him to lose his daughter, and he lost four of his X-15 pilot friends were killed and then his best friend ed white lost his life in the apollo one fire and uh you know they call him a recluse they call him this that and the other he was an affable guy i i know people in ohio that were at uh, uh, uh bratwurst beer festivals Oktoberfest, very popular because there's a big polish com community and polka dancing stuff going on in uh, ohio where he grew up and uh, he'd have a beer or two and have a lot of fun. He wasn't a, a, a sourpuss type of guy. But he knew that he needed to be anonymous as much as he could. And the great uh, Charles Lindbergh told him, do not stop autographing stuff, all right? I got off on the tangent stuff, but uh, because you'll never be able to sit down and eat a meal if you don't get uh, it out that you're not going to autograph in public like Lindbergh did. So good advice to Neil, and he stuck to that. There is uh, uh, the, the landing, the walking around, and there's a scale of 20 meters is the little line there. This is about 100 meters, okay, 300 feet across is the landing, is where they walked. So that's a football field, folks. But that only Neil walked out far, except for Buzz walked out where the figure eight is at the bottom there. That's where he deployed the scientific experiments. But all the activity was mostly around the lunar module, as you see at the top there. And in this picture, again, there's the lunar module in the upper left and the, the uh, east crater. Where they were working, Marty, most of the time where they spent their time was the size of a basketball court. So put a basketball court at one end of the football field end zone, and that's you're looking at about how much these guys got around in that two hours that they were on the surface. About two hours for Buzz, two hours and 20 minutes for Neil. Again, these photographs taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that is still active orbiting the moon. There's a beautiful picture of, uh, of Buzz. I love this picture. It's not well played. Uh, they'll crop out the... That, and what's beside him is a solar wind experiment, basically a sheet of aluminum that he put up so that the, the wind, particles from the wind, are constantly bombarding the surface of the moon because there's no atmosphere. Uh, uh, not particles from the solar wind, all right? This is the actual atmosphere of the sun that blows off 
and 93 million miles later, you know, can can impact the moon. So that was kind of a static experiment that Buzz put up right away. <coughs> and here is the most classic shot of human history. I call this, I, I would challenge you to find another picture that has probably more widely been published and spread than this picture. Might be the Hindenburg, Marty, burning up would be a pretty good one. But uh, uh, a U.S. stamp, everything made of this. But they crop in on it. And look at the lower right-hand corner is the lunar landing leg, and you see the pole, the five-foot contact pole, that a blue light would come on, contact light, when that pole, there were three of them. They didn't have one over the landing uh, uh, ladder where they went down because they were afraid that might stick up and they wouldn't be get down the ladder. So this was how they knew that they were five feet off the ground, and then then uh, Neil uh, didn't hit the engine and crash it down like he was supposed to, because the shock absorbers in the lunar legs were built to get to to for that, and he just put it down like a feather. Neil did, and that's why that first rung on the ladder was a little bit of a leap for those guys to get up to it. But now I'm going to show you some interesting pictures. There is a uh, uh, Andy Sanders uh, back in 19, uh, 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 2019 was working on restoring these images. And this is, we call this the visor shot. Obviously, we call it the visor shot because you see Neil Armstrong and the lunar module is in the visor of Buzz there. And so this has been enhanced and enlarged to that picture that you see on the right where we can see Neil clearly on the moon taking the picture of Buzz, his long shadow in front of him there. That's something I want to point out that they wanted to land near the terminator of the moon where the shadows are long and they could see detail very clearly. In the middle of a noonday sun, you don't see any shadows, so you don't gauge distances and, and sizes very good because there's no shadows to help you. So that was the idea that they landed on the moon. Think if the sun rises at 7.30 in the morning, this is about 9 o'clock in the morning. They wanted long, strong shadows. Might even be like 8.30 in the morning uh, kind of moon time. But now I'm going to show you another very famous image, all right? Everybody has seen this image of uh, Buzz Aldrin saluting the flag there and the lunar module there. The flag is waving because this is a hoax, folks. No, it's not. Of course not. This is The flag looks like it's waving because they put a pole out there. And, and two, two, uh, before I get into this famous image, if you think that we didn't go to the moon, I'm sorry for your intellect, all right? But if we didn't go to the moon, how come the Russians didn't say we went to the moon? Because they wanted to go to the moon and prove communism was superior. Every feat that they did in the moon race, from the first man to walk in space to the dockings that they, they kind of were a hoax because they really didn't dock, they flew close to each other a couple times. Um, they were all to prove the superiority of the communist way of life. And our democracy was strong and we beat them. Then why did we do it six more times and why did we not have Apollo 13 land? Marty says, why did we do it six more times? And why didn't we have Apollo 13 land? Why we did we have a disaster? And if we didn't go to the moon, I want Marty to give back his retirement money and all those Grumman's making a fortune in their retirement. And they deserve so, okay? He looks at me with cross eyes there. Pretty good retirement though, Marty. Uh, but you know, you know what I'm saying? They made money uh, to finance their families, education of their kids, buy homes, cars. Give all that money back if we didn't go to the moon, all right? Some reparations there. That's a real, real, real clincher there. The $40 billion spent in 1969 money, that's $400 billion today, folks. Half a trillion dollars is what this program would cost today. And heck, maybe they spent that on Artemis already. But look at Buzz there, looking at the flag, right? Nope. This guy, Andy Sanders, got into the helmet reflection there uh, pixel by pixel and look what he brought out here's looking at you buzz that's right buzz aldrin's head is turned to the side looking at neil you can get a hint of it there on this classic photograph 
of mankind's greatest journey there. Whoop. So let me go there. That's the full enhanced view, and there's the close-up. The buzzer has turned his head to look at Neil, and they, the, 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 the whole body has to turn almost to look at something. You're inside a fishbowl there. That head ain't swiveling around, all right? He's, and there it is. And he's got kind of a wry grin on his face there. But you can clearly see his eyes and nose, forehead. He's got the Snoopy, the white Snoopy cap on. So this is the work of Andy Sanders, a, uh, a, a British uh, photographer that painstakingly spent a lot of time on this, uh, finding Buzz's uh, face in this classic shot. And uh, so I remember talking to Mark, uh, Tom Usiak about that, Tom. You remember me uh, calling you up and messaging you to... Because uh, I saw a pretty good print that I could see Buzz. You can find a print once in a while that'll show this pretty good. And I found a first or second generation print in our archives, and uh, which I gave to our collections analyst Chuck Jeffrey to uh, uh, put in an auction. And I could kind of see Buzz's face in in the screen there. Here also is Buzz again took his visor, his his sunglasses off. This is the film camera that was in the pilot triangular mirror there that Buzz activated before he went down the ladder at one frame a second. That's how we can see both of them working on together there. So Marty, I know we got some friends. I'm coming to the end here. He's going to give me the list of everyone to stay curious today. I uh, thought we'd have a, a, a kind of a short show, but I've been running my mouth here uh, with some of the trivia that we have. Thanks, Marty. Uh, Christopher Mick, hope you're enjoying it. Hey, Ashley Kendrick. I know that you've never seen that picture of Buzz Aldrin's head turn there. I'll bet you like that. And give our granddaughter a big hug there for me when you see her. Robert Law, thank you for your faithful watching. Ophelia Sautero, she's watching from Normandy, France. Dave Stangy's up there in hot and humid Michigan, I'll bet. William Whiting and Corey Blackburn, thank you for watching. Uh, uh, ben Her Herset uh, and Gary Gerald is watching. Uh, and Larry Pushker, thank you, Larry, for watching. Larry's been inside here. I'll bet, Larry, you're kind of flipped out how things are all mishmashed around in here because he was here in the spring. And uh, Denny Noah, all right. And uh, Marty, I saw Gary, our former uh, uh, condo mate, uh, out at the Space Museum today, and he's doing real good. He's there all the time. Yep, yep, he's there all the time. Uh, and mention the video. With Neil going down the ladder. The video of Neil as he goes down the ladder. Uh, what about the video? Just that it's more than. Somebody just commented that Neil, here's pictures of Neil coming down the, the ladder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pictures of Neil coming down the ladder, everything like that. Why would we fake all that kind of stuff on the video and so forth? That's crazy to think. And it's an insult to 500,000 people that did what they could to get us to the. Uh, uh, the moon and part of the emphasis was yes President Kennedy being assassinated him saying we're going to do it for the end of the decade there is Neil uh, but one of the shots that Buzz uh, peeled off of Neil there with the backside there um, um, and uh, uh, but we also we well I'll talk about that here in a second yes these panoramas are beautiful uh, there are both astronauts again. The shadow of Neil and, and uh, Buzz is uh, there at the lunar module there. Uh, these uh, panoramas have been enhanced greatly. Uh, and you can buy them. They're called Moon Pans, I think, is the company that sells them on there. But, yes, you can put your handprints. The only place in the world, Titusville, Florida, where you can put your handprints on Buzz and Neil and another 30-some Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronauts. Uh, in there, uh, uh, Cliff uh, Cliff Watson, or Cliff Wilson. I bet it's Cliff Watson. I'm sorry, yeah, Watson. Yeah, yep. Uh, Cliff Watson is my buddy in uh, Sonoma, Australia, and that reminds me, Cliff. Thanks for chiming in there. Haven't talked to you in a while, buddy. Uh, we'll have to email. Uh, we'll have to message someday. The transmissions of the lunar landing live television. Uh, on, on Sunday, July 20th at 10.50 uh, a.m. Uh, when Neil went down the ladder until about 1 a.m. The video came through a dish 
in uh, Perth, Australia, okay? And you need to see the movie The Dish. That's all about that. And I think one of the stars of that is the star of Jurassic Park, the main scientist of that. I don't know his name. But it's a really cool story because there was a tremendous thunderstorm going through there that they weren't sure that the dish uh, wouldn't fly off its base at the direction they had to do it. And it's a fun movie of the, of the, the people involved with this and, and, and the, the trauma they had. Uh, and almost we almost didn't capture that movie. And then they found in their archives there at this uh, uh, radio dish site in Australia the original uh, 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 transcripts, uh, videos of it. But there's Buzz's handprints. Those people, by the way, gave us $100 to immortalize their name on the pylons there at Space View Park. Marty, you're on a couple of them, the shuttle and the, and the, the uh, Apollo Monument area. Yeah. And uh, I wish I worked for Newsweek Magazine, Marty. I wish they asked me $100 because I'd put my name on the side of Madison Avenue skyscraper at, uh, what was that, 444 Madison Avenue, I think is where uh, Newsweek was in this 100-story skyscraper. There's the man, Buzz Aldrin's handprints there with the beautiful statue that Sandy Storm did of our president, uh, President Kennedy. Uh, in fact, Caroline Kennedy saw this statue in a photograph, uh, and her friend uh, got back to the museum and said that she wanted to buy it. And, well, there was only one made, and the mold was broke, so she couldn't buy it, but she said it was the best rendition she'd seen of her dad like that and his great speech is on the uh, is on the podium there uh and uh there is neil armstrong's handprints there and mr president we not only did it in july 20th 1969 to meet your pledge of doing it at the end of the decade we doubled down and did it twice and went back and landed in november with apollo 12 to fulfill your pledge twice and uh uh, like Marty and everybody that worked there said, you can't deny that was some impetus of, of him being murdered and to fulfill that promise. There he is, Neil Armstrong, the most well-worn of all of our bronze handprints of astronauts. Uh, quite a process to get that. Our godfather, Charlie Mars, uh, was the one that got Neil's and most of, of the, uh, the handprints that are at Space View Park, and we have a few of them here in our museum. So... So uh, there's a great, let's go back to Mr. President there as we go out to, to say thank you for watching this episode of Stay Curious. And uh, uh, we're going to be back tomorrow uh, with another program and talking about shuttle, uh, space shuttle history tomorrow on Friday. Um, I've been in communication a little bit with Triple T, not sure if he's going to be up to He's under the weather a little bit. Maybe he'll be here. We'll find out tomorrow. But we'll have a program for you anyway. Thank you all for letting me run my mouth about my exuberance of Apollo 11. Of course, I'll never forget it. Uh, and uh, it should be a national holiday, July 20th. Uh, after all, we've got Columbus Day, all right, when he sort of discovered America. He really discovered the Dominican Republic and, and uh, the Virgin Islands there and so forth, I think. Uh, but uh, maybe one day they'll come to their senses and make July 20th. They call it International Moon Day, all right? But nobody, the banks didn't close, Marty. <laughs> okay, so uh, when the banks close, it's an official holiday in America, okay, folks? So, well, everybody, thank you. Armstrong and Aldrin have left the moon at about 5.30 today. You can watch it live where they get up with their buddy, Mike Collins, who is thrilled as, as, as all could be. To, uh, to see his buddies back in, in the moonship eagle. So thank you, Marty, for another great job. Thank you all for being staying curious. I'm Mark Marquette, and I'll see you again tomorrow to bridge the space between us.